please turn over to the book of Leviticus, chapter 23. Leviticus 23. We see that in verse 33, uh, which we, we read uh, this past week, which we're not going to necessarily um, read every single verse of it, uh, but you look over at verse 40. Uh, we see that it says that you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of the beautiful trees, the branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees, the willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. And you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year, and it shall be a statute for every inner generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. And you shall dwell in booths or tabernacles for seven days. All who are native Israeli, um, Israelites shall dwell in booths. That your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwelt in, to, to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. All right, so this, this is kind of the, the context for which uh, we've been celebrating the feast. Uh, it, it is, um, as we said last week, uh, even before Passover was, was mentioned, um, God said, I want you to go out into the desert and, and to dwell in, in, in tents. Uh, which was, of course, the only way that people could really dwell in the desert at that time, for the most part, anyway. But he was setting the stage for what he desired. Uh, and the whole purpose wasn't so they could go out into the desert, dwell in lents, uh, dwell in tents, um, drink wine and, and eat stuff. Uh, what was the purpose of them going out in the desert and dwelling in tents? What, what was the intention of all that? To separate themselves. Okay, one, to separate themselves, and two, primarily to worship, God. worship and commune with God. Okay, that's what God wanted. And so he set the stage by saying, this is what I want. But I'm going to have to do something in order for you to commune with me. I'm, something's going to have to die to cover your sins and so, and so forth. And he set forth the sacrificial tradition of which was necessary for. In fact, they couldn't have gone out into the desert to commune with God until the blood had been shed. And we know that this is, of course, a, uh, a foreshadowing, which... God laid down in, in, in the Torah and in the rest of the writings of the Tanakh, the Old Testament. He was foreshadowing something that was greater than all of this. Uh, that was the whole purpose behind everything. So in, in order to commune with God, for you and me to commune with God, do we um, like kill um, goats and sheep and everything? Do we have to do that anymore? Okay. For that matter, do our Jewish people do that? No, they don't, because the temple was destroyed. No more sacrifices. No sacrifice, no blood, no forgiveness. But we have found forgiveness in and through the greatest of all sacrifices. When the, the, uh, the prophet and forerunner John said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Messiah was the purpose behind all of the sacrifices. And that's why we as believers, as, as messianics, do not kill a blood, sorry, do not kill the goat or a sheep or an oxen to burn it, to ask God for forgiveness because we have come to God by. So just like our people had to, that a, a, um, a sheep had to die and the blood had to be put on the house, right? And how many, um, how many um, marks were put on that house? Three. Okay, so we had the mark at the top, the mark on the sides. Okay, foreshadowing. Blood on the house, but foreshadowing the crucifixion of Messiah in the middle, then the two thieves on either side. Foreshadowing that in order to be saved, to have death pass you over. See, that death passing over was a, a, a small thing. But what we ask for when the blood of Messiah is, a, is a put on our house, this house, is that eternal death will pass us over. Okay. That's always what it has been about, was the foreshadowing of and the pointing towards the pure and true sacrifice. Well, we find ourselves uh, um, celebrating the eighth day of the seven-day feast, which is, again, sort of a mystery. But there it is. Uh, and it is a, um, it was something that had a, a significance. Uh, during this time, uh, it, it's, 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 it's not so much outside of Israel, but even still today, um, it, the Feast of Sukkot is, is not just a time to, to uh, put up a sukkah and 
eat and drink and, 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 and sing songs. What is it in Israel also at this time of the year? Harvest. It's a harvest time. Okay? Again, we were and, were and then weren't and then now are again, the Israelis, an agricultural people. You, you, you and I, for the most part, so there's a few hand, handy or green thumb people out there, our, the extent of our agriculture is maybe you put some flowers in your yard, maybe you have a garden, but most of us, our experience with agriculture is browsing the produce aisle. Okay, that's my agriculture right there. But in Israel, everything depended upon something in the land in order for stuff to grow. What was that? Rain, that's right, water. No water, no rejoicing. And so there was a particular prayer that was said at this time uh, on the eighth day for rain. Uh, we've, we've said it before in the past. Uh, we're not going to do it particularly this year. But the significance was is that we pray for rain. Okay? If there's no rain in Israel, what is Israel by, by, by definition normally? It's a desert, really. Okay? And, and it was a desert. And, and then when our people went back to, to Israel, it became, again, a lush place because we irrigated. Uh, as um, the, the people. So we took a desert place and made it into a place that reflected something spiritual. So this particular prayer was, um, and again, this is historically, that there was a, a, a ceremony that was, was um, where water was gathered into a pitcher, and the high priest would pr um, pray a prayer and then would pour out the water as, as a symbol of asking for God's uh, providence in rain. So it was necessary so, um, if you turn over to John, the book of John, chapter 4, there's a, a kind of rain or a kind of water that we in particular are interested in. John, chapter 4. Verse 13, of course, this is the, the, uh, the time in which he went to a well in Samaria, uh, where a woman was, and, and what did he ask her for? Uh, a latka, uh, some shawarma, what, 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 what was he looking for? He wanted to drink a water. He, he was thirsty. Okay, so in this well, which was, so this well, which was no longer in, in the territory of, of the Jewish people, but in, in the um, territory of the Samaritans, uh, was the well of Jacob. Uh, so uh, he basically says, you know, give me a drink of water. And he says that if you, if you would ask me, I would give you living water. So in verse 13, he says, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever th drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing into everlasting life. Okay. So we're going to kind of delve into the metaphor really quickly. He gives us living water, and, and where does that living water go? Okay. Where? Again, metaphorically. Inside of us, that's right. Okay, and so that, he gives us living water, and then what happens? What does it say? That, okay, it becomes a fountain. So he, he gives us of this living water, and then we become a source of blessing. Okay, and, and, the, and the, the words that he uses are or what? A fountain of living water springing up into what? Okay, so this world is a desert. And you have become one of these fountains that he has given to you, a, a sip of the living water. Okay, and he is the living water. And he in us is supposed to accomplish something in us. He is supposed to, to do something by being present within us that we become something, not just for ourselves. Okay, we're not just a living fountain to, 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 to enjoy the fountain. But what is the purpose of a fountain or a spring? It's to share the, the water. And what is the water that we, that we should be sharing? The word. It, it should be something that is, of the, what this day pictures is God dwelling in us is not just for us, but it's for the life of the world. Okay. God is, is working in the world, and not just not strictly through his believers, but a, a whole lot of it is through his believers. That we are to be carriers of this living water that sh we share with those around us. Um, 
And so this was a significance because the, the water that was important, the water that comes from the sky and, and rains upon the earth is, is very important because that it creates the crops and the, and the food in which we will, we will be able to eat. But even more important than that is the rain or the water that comes from the Spirit of God within us that creates something within us that is more valuable than, than all the food around us. Because what is done in us is for the life of the world and, and our life, our, our eternal life, Prakasha. So we see that this was, uh, in particular, uh, the, the uh, prayer for rain. Uh, Psalm 114. Psalm 114. And verse 8. Well, actually, we'll begin in verse 7. So, Psalm 114 and verse 7. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a mountain of waters. Okay, when, and he did this several times uh, while the, our, our people were, were wandering in the desert, uh, what, what did he do in order to bring water many times? Okay. Okay, the rock, um, multifaceted symbol. Uh, what do you think the rock it might picture? Messiah. Okay, it could picture Messiah. But what, how about something that is specific to perhaps each one of us? What do you think it might signify? What's that? Okay, hardness of heart. Um, in fact, Messiah, uh, through the words of the prophet, says, I will take out of you a heart of stone and put into you a heart of flesh. And so he either strikes the stone or, or speaks to the stone and, and out of it comes water. Okay? And when you're in the desert, water is pretty important. In fact, it might be all you think about, especially when you're thirsty. So he takes us as, again, a symbol of our hardness of heart. And he either speaks to our hearts or he starts to strike it in order for living water to come from us but is not always about us. It is about what he is doing in us and through us. And do you have hardness of heart? Yeah. Yes, I do. Okay, but I've been a believer for 10 years, 20 years, 40 years. Doesn't matter. We are living beings and we change. We either grow warmer or hotter. Sorry, colder or warmer. We move at various times. Our hearts can be alive or or they can be hard. But God says, I wish to speak to that rock and to give bring forth rather than having to strike it. So this eighth day uh, in the diaspora, this, the outside of Israel, uh, these, these feasts, um, Shemin Yatzeret and Simchat Torah, are, are generally separated um, into two feasts. But in this day, um, and in Israel, we celebrate the same feast together. The eighth day, the completion of uh, the New beginning of, which symbolizes God tabernacling with humanity forever. And joy in the Torah. Okay, the joy in the Torah, what do you think that symbolizes? Simcha Torah. What, what, is, what is joy in the Torah? Love of God. Okay, love of God. Um, are, are we glad that we have a bunch of scrolls with a bunch of letters on it? I mean, is, is, is that what we're, what we're joyful about? What is it that we are joyful about? Okay, what, what the scrolls and letters tell us? Okay, the content. Um, so, join in the Torah. So, do you think our people have always been like really happy about the Torah? I mean, does, does the history of our people tell us that? Yay, Torah! What happens to our people oftentimes, even still today? Complacent. The majority of the Jewish people are not even observant. Only a small little um, percentage of them. The vast majority of our Jewish people are secular and don't give God a second thought or they worship other gods. Um, they don't care. They want to do it their way. Okay, All along, God has been saying, no, I don't want you to do it your way. I want you to do it my way. 
Okay, my way is do not touch the hot oven. Do not touch the hot stove. Is, is God saying, I don't want you to have any fun? No, he's saying that when we touch the hot oven or hot stove, we're going to get burned and damaged. And he doesn't want that. Any more than when you tell your child, don't go run out in the street. Oh, mom, dad, you'll never let me have any fun. I want to go get run over by a car. But that's what we do. That's what humanity does when they turn their back on God, who says, my words, my teachings, is what Torah truly translates into, not law, but teachings of God. My teachings are there for your benefit. My teachings are there so that you will have life and have it abundantly. Okay. If, if you don't love your child, don't tell them to do anything. Don't give them any boundaries. Don't give them any, any, any rules. Don't give them anything that will impede them. And you'll show your child how much you hate them. But our God has said, I love you. And here's what I want you to do. If you will follow my ways, it will become for you a tree of life. And it's not about following the words in there. It's the intentions behind the words. Okay? As believers, we don't look at the Torah and try to follow every single commandment in the Torah because the majority of them aren't even applicable anymore because they don't have, we have no sacrifices anymore. Okay? We don't live in land. We don't live under a theocracy. We don't live under a king. But the intentions behind many of the laws still remain. And the Ten Commandments will never go away. And so God has said, if you want life, if you, if, you, if you want to avoid all of the pitfalls, follow my ways. Okay? When Messiah came, he began to um, extrapolate on things in the Torah to give us insights into what God really genuinely wanted. Okay? Uh, in, in, the, in the Torah, it deals with everything out here. Messiah comes and he says, I'm going to show you what all of that was about. It's about dealing with this inside of here. Okay? I can not physically touch somebody, but I could wish them dead in my heart. And what is that called? Murder. Murder? Hate. Um, and so the Torah doesn't deal with anything inside, but it was pointing to something that would. And the inner meaning of the Torah is what Messiah came to show us, was that it, it is, this is important out here. Um, yes, you, you, could, you, could, you could injure somebody uh, by doing a variety of things out here, but you're injuring yourself by following through with thoughts of hate, thoughts of, 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 of all the things. So he says, Messiah does to the, to the Pharisees, who did all this right out here, mostly, but they neglected the inside and he says, you whitewashed tombs. Why do you think he called them that? Whitewashed tombs. Okay. So, and I, it wasn't a compliment that he called them a tomb to begin with. Um, because necessarily, one doesn't want to refer to as a grave. It's not the most applicable things. Oh, you're the best looking grave I've ever seen. No. Because inside of a grave, there's what? Death and corruption. Okay, corruption is the decay of this body. So, to begin to call them a tomb, he wasn't, wasn't, was not paying them a compliment. But he was saying that you look good on the outside. I mean, if you go to, I mean, let's just say it, some cemeteries are more beautiful than others. Even still, I mean, you can go, have a picnic. Um, <laughs> they look better than others. And there's some of them that are kind of overgrown and, and kind of like, you know, they're not very well taken care of, and you're like, yeah, I don't think I want to go there, but they're the same thing. They're places of death. And so he says, I want you to become something different than that. So joy in the Torah. Joy in the Torah. What do you think that we as believers can, can gather out of this? What kind of joy would we find? What is the, what is the joy that, that you would, would find within the words and, and, the, and the teachings? Of it? Okay, the path of eternal life. Okay, drawing closer to him. Love. He is love. He loved us first so that now we can love him because we wouldn't know love had he not loved us first. So, do you think God says, I want you to love, but you can do everything. You can just, just do it however you want it. Is, is, that, is that what God says? 
Why do you think he gave us a way? Understanding everything that is in eternity. Okay. All that is, is seen and unseen. God knows the perfect way for us to get to him. Okay. Well said. He knows the perfect way for us to ascend to him. Okay. When the children of Israel were in Egypt and they're crying out, and did God say to them, I hear you. Um, uh, you know, go ahead and come on out of Egypt. Just, just, just put your mind to it. You can, you, you can do this. Did, did, did he say that? Or did he bring them out? And did he show them the way? Did he institute the priesthood? Did he institute his way? Because that's what he wanted. And he gave us the way because he loves us. He says to a, to a child that I do not chastise, I don't love. So if he does chastise us, that means that we are his and that we are loved by him. Okay? As, a, as, as a person, as a, uh, as a child growing up, I couldn't really understand that uh, because what child wants to get in trouble? Um, what child goes, thank you, mom and dad, for chastising me? <laughs> Nobody, ever. But as an adult, I began to go, oh, okay, I understand that now. That's, that's why they did this. And now, as a parent, I go, yep, I, I understand even more than I did 100 years ago. And so God, being the perfect parent, it says, this is what I want you to do and how I want you to do it so that you can enter into life. Um, person who wants to go their own way and do their own thing. Can you, can you think of like, like a scripture in, in the Old Testament, the, the, the Tanakh that says something, con, or something similar to um, people doing whatever they want? Okay, there's a way that seems right to a man. At the end of their way is destruction. And, and the, that, that's a good one. And there's another one that I'm thinking of as well. Possibly. The, the one that I'm thinking of, is there was no king in Israel. And every person did what they saw what was right in their own eyes. Did that make God happy? No, because they caused suffering. They caused themselves suffering and they caused suffering around them. Because God said, here's what I desire. And our people constantly said, that's great, God, but I want to do it my way. So to have, find joy in the Torah means that we understand that God loves us and he's given us that which will make us the most fulfilled. Okay, does God promise us that in this life we will have no trouble whatsoever? No. In fact, if we follow him, we're probably going to have even more trouble. But suffering for an unbeliever is just suffering. Suffering for a believer in Messiah is an opportunity. And that's a mystery. It doesn't make any sense. Because nobody goes, yeah, I can't wait to suffer. But nothing beautiful is created without this process. Okay. A building is built through the destruction of something that is there and the erection and creation of something that is hopefully beautiful. Gold is not made beautiful. It comes out of the earth kind of mucky, um, kind of shiny, kind of mucky, and, and, and all the muck has to be burned off in order for it to become beautiful. And so it is with us. So we see that this was the purpose to have joy in the Torah means that we have this understanding that his ways are there for us to draw upon so that we do not have to figure things out ourselves. We don't have to like be those that are wandering in fact, what did he call, um, Messiah did, what did he call the Pharisees, who did a lot of good stuff, and, and, and many of them were very righteous. In fact, many of them became believers. But what did he call them? Um, Brood of vipers, yes, that, that, was, that was a good one. But he, he called them something like this. Blind okay, blind guides, leading a guide. So uh, to be blind um, is one thing, but to be blind and, and, and leading people, uh, that's a mess. Um, he called blind leading the blind. And so he says, that's not what I'm looking for. He wanted his people to follow those who had been illumined. And so here's where he begins his work while he was here on earth. So this joy in the Torah, which we're going to, uh, we're going to do uh, one of the ancient traditions 
in just a moment. Uh, it, it's a very beautiful uh, ceremony in which um, the congregation comes forward, and many of you who have been here for, for several years remember this and, and know it, but for those who will be watching perhaps for the first time, um, it, it is a, a re-rolling of the, the Torah. Uh, the uh, five books are read in, in a year period. We just um, celebrated the beginning of the, the new year. Uh, the, at, pretty much at the end of this feast, uh, there is a, a return from the end of Deuteronomy to the beginning of Genesis. Uh, and we'll read, uh, after we, we all participate in, in the Torah rolling, uh, we'll, I will read uh, the first few verses of Genesis. Um, it's a, it's a, it's, it, it, each year is a return to the beginning. Um, why do you think we, we read the same scriptures over and over? It was a little hard-headed to remember. To remember. <coughs> Say it again. Right? Um, for the same reason we have to eat. Um, I mean, we'd be pretty much sad if, if we said, well, that was my last meal. I'm going to have forever. Uh, I mean, you'd be like, yeah, I'm okay for the next couple hours or 15 minutes if you're a teenager. Um, why do we say a lot of the same prayers over and over and over again? Because we forget? Um, why else? Okay, so it would be written upon us, upon our hearts and minds. Okay, repetition is essential for learning. I mean, here's, here's a repetition we never get, just get tired of, right? Huh? Uh, you know, for those who don't like, don't like repetition, I guess you could stop eating if you wanted. But no, we, we, we enter in this, so we, we always begin again. It's like there's, there's, there's like a cycle that we return to so that we, that we continue to remember and we continue to learn. Uh, if you read it a thousand times, on the thousand and one time, you're going to see something different. What changed? You did. I did. Our minds were opened a little bit more that we see something different. Yep, faith comes by. Does faith come by seeing? No, not really. It comes by hearing. And faith is continually nourished by the hearing, which is why you should be reading your scripture out loud as much as you can. Definitely the Psalms. Um, in, in, your, in your daily prayers, you're reading the Psalms out loud, many of them, and, and there's other scriptures that, that you read. You read it because there's something, when we hear it, that it sinks even deeper into us. Uh, and here's why, um, in synagogues and in, in many churches, the, the Word of, of God, the, the Scriptures aren't mimed, um, and, and they're not like, you know, portrayed up on pictures up there. They're what? They're read out loud. They're spoken. Um, even chanted. Uh, if you go to, to a synagogue, uh, the, the readings, particularly from the Torah, they're actually chanted in, in particular melody. Okay? They're not just read. They're actually chanted. Uh, and many of, of the writings of the prophets are also chanted, the Haftarahs. So the chanting of the scriptures is, is, is one of the ancient, most ancient Jewish practices. It's, it's been around for as long as we've been around. So we are going to, if I remember correctly, is there a, is there a slide for the re-rolling? I can't remember. And there you go. So as is our tradition, if everyone would kind of form on the side here, like, just like we would do for um, communion. Uh, and then as you come up, I'm um, going to have um, Roy, if you could help me with this. Uh, again, it's a beautiful time, which we'll remove this. I'll just kind of fold this and set it over here. So if you've never seen a, a Torah scroll up close, um, or if you have... Um, this particular scroll, um, which, as I've mentioned before, but for those the benefit of those who are watching, it's, it's about 150 years old. Uh, we acquired it. Um, it actually was um, written or scribed uh, in Russia. It took, uh, literally takes about a year to a year and a half for a sofer, a scribe, to, to write uh, the, the Torah itself. It's connected by um, sections of this parchment. And the parchment comes from... Um, a, a kosher animal, in this, in this case, uh, a cow. And each section, it, it, it's um, um, 
sewn together by the sinew or, or the muscle of a kosher animal, uh, likely either um, a sheep or a cow as well. And so each of those sections uh, takes a phenomenal amount of time because you have to copy it line by line. Every time that the, the, the sofer comes to the, um, the name, uh, Hashem, which is the yud heh vav uh, which we, we, we say very reverently uh, as the name of God, each time that he comes to this point, he has to, when he, before he begins, he literally gets up and he goes and he immerses himself um, in a mikvah, in, in a pool of water, and then recloses himself with, with um, white linen garments and comes back to write the name. Uh, if he makes a mistake while writing the name, um, he has to remove or, or stop that, that whole section. Can you imagine getting, spending a good week writing all the way down, you get to the very last line and you mess up? That whole section has to be uh, carefully rolled and is placed in the Geniza, the, uh, the cemetery um, of is below most synagogues uh, and is not used. He starts that section again. So there's a great reverence for the name of God, which of course is um, you know, a, a, a healthy reverence. So this particular scroll, um, we acquired it from Jerusalem um, many years ago. And so it has been a blessing to us. So um, as again, if you would inform on the side over here, um, as you come forward, um, you're going to take the, the, the rollers and we're going to uh, unroll this together. And then we're going to re-roll uh, the portion of, of it back towards the beginning. So, Rabbi Kevin, are, are you able to, to play for us? Um, for many people, um, to be able to, to see the, the words um, written in Hebrew um, is, a, is a great blessing. Uh, to be able to see what we have been using for so many centuries, uh, thousands of years, uh, there were no books like we have them today. Uh, there were only these. This is five books of the Old Testament. Um, each synagogue was fortunate to have just the Torah uh, if they were able to have some of the scrolls. So each synagogue didn't have the complete Old Testament like we would call it. Uh, and so many times people had a greater ability to remember things greater than my ability. And they, they memorized whole books of the prophets and they could quote them. And so for us to be able to have a book that has the, the scriptures in them is a huge blessing. But I invite you to, to come forward uh, and to help me with the re-rolling as we return to the beginning. How many hands have touched this? How many eyes have seen? How many thousands of people have witnessed?
heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. days of King Josiah, the Torah had been lost, but it really hadn't been lost. It had just been hidden. And so they found in beneath the temple, the place where the Torah was hidden, the scrolls. When they found it, they took it and they began to read it to the people out loud. And the words of the Lord had been read to the, our people for, hadn't been read for, for so long. It says that when they, they read and heard of the words, that the people wept. Because as a heart is illumined and is open to the words of God, things become different. Hearts become different. The prophets say that God wants to write upon a heart of flesh within us. Take the heart of stone that we have acquired and make it heart of flesh. This very Sefer Torah itself is entirely organic uh, outside of the wood, which actually is organic as well. But the parchment itself is, is kosher, uh, from an animal. The sinew which it's bound together is also organic and it is written upon the heart of this scroll much like God desires his Torah to be writ, written upon us. see and we hear and that we do. Out of respect for whenever the, the Sefer is not in the, the Ark, it is covered with as elegant of, of a cloth as is possible. This particular uh, bima cover uh, comes from Jerusalem. Uh, it was on a, a bima there, and again, for many years it was used to read the, the Torah there at the Western Wall. Thank you, Rabbi Kevin. Genesis chapter 1. In Hebrew, the very first word uh, is Barashit, uh, which means in the beginning, 
God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and the void and darkness. was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, and it was very good. And God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And so the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Then God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and so it was. God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning was the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear, and so it was. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass and the herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to the kind whose seed is in itself on the earth. And so it was. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seeds according to its kind, and the tree yields fruit whose seed was itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And we know again the rest of the story of his creation. The story of creation um, is a foreshadowing of what God knew would happen. He, he knew when he began the creation process of what we would do as human beings. And he immediately let us know as, as humanity that he had a plan to bring back his creation. Uh, and so when he speaks to our hearts and he, the Spirit, hovers over this heart and darkness is divided from light as light enters us, the Spirit of God. And this creation process is happening in us right now. You're not complete yet. I'm not complete yet, for God knows that. We're still in the creation process of beginning and growing towards the fullness of what he has. Uh, because unless you can walk on water and create bread out of nowhere um, and, and, and disappear and, and appear without any, anything, you're not complete yet. We don't, have, we, don't have, we don't have the glorified body yet like Messiah does, but he says, I got it for you. We, we're still stuck with, with this body that is decaying right now. And so he says, finish the race. Stay the course. Walk along the straight path according to my commandments. And then I got you. And oh, by the way, you're going to be with me forever. That is something that's worth pursuing. Amen? So may you rejoice today and every day. And know that you're His. And seek Him with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Uh, and let us rejoice this day. Baruch Hashem. Amen.